Okay, today's mini lecture is on the fluid mosaic model of membrane structure. Um, you should have already watched Miss Carter's lovely video on phospholipids and why they form bilayers, so I'm not going to go into that kind of detail. But you do need to know why it is called the fluid mosaic model. So what the fluid bit refers to is that the uh, molecules can move laterally, in the, that means sideways, in the membrane. So molecules moving laterally. So it acts pretty much like an oil. <clears throat> and mosaic refers to the random pattern of proteins. So Mr. Singer and Mr. Nicholson, who um, initially put this model forward in 1972, before then they knew it was made of phospholipid and protein, but they didn't know how the protein sort of fitted into the um, into the pattern. So they had a sort of a, a bilayer with the, where it was all just surrounded, coated over with proteins. <coughs> um, Singer and Nicholson did a technique called freeze fracture where they actually split it along the line of its least resistance, i.e. through the middle of the bilayer, and found out that there were all these sort of bubbles and boulders in it, and the proteins were actually embedded into the membrane in a random pattern. Uh, so that that's the sort of currently accepted model of membrane structure, and it does kind of explain, it's got quite a lot of experimental evidence to back that um, model up. So, we'll just start with the phospholipid bilayer. So we've got our hydrophilic heads, hydrophobic tails. Now the significance of that is this hydrophobic layer is made of fatty acids. So it's an effective barrier against anything crossing over there that dissolves in water. So water-soluble things won't go across. They can interact with the heads, but not um, not with the tail. So they can't cross over the membrane, and that makes it semi or selectively permeable. <coughs> so the the phospholipids kind of job is to make it selectively permeable, as well as sort of moving sideways been told I've got to stop waving my hands around, it makes the focus go funny. There we go. So, embedded in, so this is the mosaic, embedded into this are various proteins. So I'm just going to draw uh, this one. This one goes all the way across. So um, this is an intrinsic protein which spans the membrane. Um, the membrane itself is, uh, it's about, hmm, from sort of top to bottom, so if you were to measure it, it's probably about between 7 and 10 nanometers, remembering that uh, 1 millimeter equals 1,000 micrometers, 1 micrometer equals 1,000 nanometers, so it's, it's it's small and that's why it looks like a line on electron micrographs. The proteins <coughs> are pretty randomly arranged and uh, you might get proteins that are just on one side of the membrane and of course it could be on one side of the membrane or the other. And those are called extrinsic proteins. So those are our sort of two <coughs> main constituents of the membrane. I'm just going to draw a little bit more membrane and I'm going to put in a channel protein. Now a channel protein is a protein that has a hydrophilic hole down the middle. 
and they are specific to particular <coughs> molecules. So when we do membrane transport, we'll be talking about uh, channel proteins uh, being involved in facilitated diffusion, helping these polar molecules across. Each one specific to the molecule that it's carrying. So just while we're on the subject of proteins, remember looking back to biological molecules, we had um, hydrophobic R groups and hydrophilic R groups. Obviously, if you're going to be sitting in a membrane where two bits are hydrophilic and this middle section is hydrophobic, anything that's in contact with the hydrophobic layer needs to be uncharged. So it needs to have those hydrophobic groups. The rest of the protein, of course, can be charged. So very much the R groups are determining how that protein lines up in the membrane. This is quite a nice sort of common line of questioning where they might give you a picture of, <coughs> of um, some, a protein with perhaps charges on it or... Um, and they don't always look like, you know, we always draw ours as, as kind of blobs. Obviously in the hydrophilic um, channels, then all the middle bit, the hole down the middle, that's all going to be hydrophilic. So these are all hydrophilic groups. And you, you need to work up an explanation of why those hydrophobic groups are where they are. <coughs> so, I said that the membrane's a bit like an oil and it will flow, and the reason that it doesn't kind of flow away, if you like, is that it has, um, I'm going to draw them like that, I think. It has little molecules of cholesterol and what cholesterol does, uh, cholesterol is a type of, uh, it's a sort of a lipid based thing, uh, so it will interact very happily with that hydrophobic fatty acid tails and its job is to, uh, I'm going to put regulate, regulate fluidity. Now, if you've got the textbook, it says that it makes the membrane rigid. Membrane is never going to be rigid because it's made of these, you know, most of it's fatty acids and quite flowy. Uh, but you can get a, a sort of, a, if you like, a, a more solid rigid structure by having more cholesterol in. The less cholesterol you've got in, the more fluid the membrane will be. So, going back to our last sort of uh, little components, um, and then we'll, I'll look at some of the functions of the proteins. So, some of the proteins, I might have to draw another couple of phospholipids in, I think. Um, some of the proteins, and indeed some of the lipids, have attached to them, and this is on the outside of the membrane only. So, I'm just going to draw a little protein in there. It doesn't matter really whether it's intrinsic or extrinsic, I've just drawn an intrinsic one. Have these, um, and you'll see them either drawn as sort of little like TV aerial branchy things, or it will actually show you the sort of uh, the hexagons of the sugar. This bit in orange <coughs> are quite small uh, carbohydrate groups and they're in chains. Those are called, their name is oligo, meaning few saccharides. So these are smaller than polysaccharides, but bigger than disaccharides, oligosaccharides. Together, so linking those two things together, by joining a carbohydrate to a protein, we have made a glycoprotein. Now you might get 
Again, only on the outer surface of the membrane, so this is outside the cell. You might get some of these oligosaccharides attached to a lipid, and you know, it's not rocket science, it's biology. In which case, we call this whole thing a glycolipid. So, just a brief look at the functions of these various bits of the membrane. So we've done that cholesterol regulates the fluidity, the hydrophobic fatty acids make that membrane selectively permeable, and the proteins fulfil a, a variety of different functions. So, they can be uh, transport, so they can function in transport, so they can be uh, carrier proteins, or they can be protein channels, and I'll just remind you that those are specific. So, <coughs> for example, if you've got cells that are needing to perhaps uh, take up glucose, they will have glucose carriers in them, but they might not have carriers for other things. So not all membranes have the full suite of, of carriers. They can be receptors, and again, you know, it depends what sort of cell you're looking at, as to what sort of receptors you've got. So for example, the hormone ADH that you'll come across in uh, component 3, is released by the pituitary gland, but it had site of action. The place with the receptors in is the collecting ducts of the kidney. Your uh, sex hormones, they're released from the brain, but their site of action is in your gonads, and those cells have the receptors for them. <coughs> they can also be enzymes. So the example that you've done already is in the mitochondrion, we've got intrinsic proteins, the ATP synthetase forms these big proteins forming the stalked particles to make ATP. So that's one place where you've heard of them being enzymes. Uh, just to move to our glycoproteins and glycolipids, together those things fo form uh, the glycocalyx. So this is just the uh, oligosaccharide bits of the outside of the membrane. So the glycocalyx, again, we're looking at uh, receptors and they are also involved in what we call cell-to-cell -cell recognition. What that means practically is that they form the antigen component of your cells. So your blood group, for example, uh, blood group A is caused by one type of oligosaccharide on the outside of your red blood cells, blood group B by a different type. Antigens are important because they allow your immune system to recognise which cells are yours. So they recognise your antigens, your glycocalyx is belonging to you, but if they encounter a foreign antigen, something like a bacteria, they recognise it as not belonging to you to initiate an immune response. Okay, I, I'm pretty much convinced I've covered that now. Okay, happy learning.